Hello. Welcome to Recalculating Your Career, Recruitment, and Hiring. I am Lindsay Pollock, one of your presenters today. We are going to get started in a moment. I just wanted to welcome everybody who's joined already and let you know that today's presentation is being recorded and we welcome you to share with your colleagues and friends. I am so delighted to partner with my friend and colleague, Nikki Garcia of Capfinity. Nikki, welcome. And would you introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about Capfinity? Thanks, Lindsay. And um, welcome to everyone who's listening in to uh, this live or maybe listening back to this session. I'm Nikki Garcia. I'm one of the co-founders of Capfinity and Capfinity works globally supporting organizations implement strengths-based solutions right from recruitment through to development. We prepare candidates to be recruitment ready. We even prepare leaders in inclusive leadership. And I'm delighted to spend this session sharing some of the research themes that Lindsay and I have worked on over the last 12 months, and also for us to do a deep dive on recalculating. So we will learn something about ourselves. Thanks, Lindsay. Nikki, very kindly let me name the session after my brand new book, Recalculating, Navigate Your Career Through the Changing World of Work, which came out on March 23rd. Um, Nikki and I also really want you to know that last time we presented, we accidentally dressed alike. So we texted each other this morning so that we wouldn't be wearing matching outfits again. Um, I'm gonna try really hard not to eat my necklace because it reminds me of jelly beans. So hopefully that will go well. And Nikki, I feel like we're coordinated, but not exactly the same. What do you think? I know, and even Latoya, you should wave Latoya. We, we seem to have got a memo about coral. So we're, we, we've got some theme and team colors coming through. I was feeling like spring might actually happen at some point. And yes, welcome Latoya Hodge of Capfinity who will be moderating our Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome again. We are going to give a little bit of background on today's agenda. We are going to talk about some research that we conducted over the past year. And the goal of sharing this with you is to explore how strengths and career choices have evolved over the last year. It's no secret that there's been a lot of change and disruption. We're gonna do a deep dive of how that impacted recruiting how that impacted career choices among college students and early career professionals, and really how it's affected uh, recruiters and leaders as well. Then we'll focus in on how virtual recruitment is impacting diversity, equity, and inclusion goals, obviously another key theme of 2020 and 21 and beyond. And then in the later portion of the program, I'm gonna give you a little preview of recalculating and talk about how you personally and as leaders in your organizations can recalculate your thinking doesn't necessarily mean pivoting or career changing, but how to constantly be navigating um, and growing and changing in this world that uh, we are calling the new normal. The research that we are going to share, we began conducting in March of 2020, very early on in the pandemic. Many of you on the call today are participants in the research, so thank you for sharing your stories and anonymously with us. Uh, Nikki and I and the team interviewed 80 people across several different industries, six countries around the world, and uh, many different sizes of organizations, although primarily large companies. We conducted over 150 hours of interviews and that qualitative and quantitative research is what we're gonna share today. And we've organized it into four key themes that will impact your recruitment in 2021 and beyond. So we'll start with the first theme and I'm gonna pass it over to Nikki to share what we found. Thanks so much, Lindsay. So the first theme that we want to share with you is around well-being and mental health. And I suspect for many of you on the call, it's possibly not a surprise that that should be a theme coming out of research that spans the last 12 months. Um, with purpose, we wanted to highlight both well-being and mental health as areas of focus. In a recent survey um, by Harvard Business Review, 85% of employees reported that their well-being has declined in the past year. And a BBC study found that more than 60% of workers are very anxious. 
Um, as an IO psychologist, this, uh, these findings and the findings from the research that Lindsay and I conducted really uh, rest with me quite heavy in terms of what can we do for the candidates that are applying for these roles and also how can we support each other as a community after a 12 months that has been uh, for many people not without uh, its trouble. One of the things that really came through um, from the recruiters that we spoke to was the empathy that they felt towards candidates, but also some worry and concern in what candidates were sharing with them. So in the wellbeing quotes I'm going to share with you, there's both the candidate perspective, but also um, notes from recruiters. So here from a candidate, when the employment market feels this competitive, it makes me want to withdraw and take time out for looking for work. So real concern from candidates around actually whether there's going to be jobs for them. Lindsay and I know there is often jobs at this time, even though it can feel incredibly stressful for candidates. One student told a recruiter and they were, um, they really shared this with us with some concern, but one, st one student told us, our Zoom event was the first time he had seen other people all day. All of his university classes were recorded lectures. And actually the campus event that the recruiter was running was the first engagement that he'd had in a, in a live context. Many students actually, this being a bit of a lifeline to them, the contact that they'd had with recruiters. As a psychologist, this particular quote, I think, is, is both fascinating and concerning. I'm really worried about introverts in the remote environment. I wonder if five years from now, introverts will be underemployed because they've been so isolated. I think this is very interesting when we think about the mechanisms that we do reach out to candidates and whether often we are expecting extroverted tendencies to come through, particularly if we're relying on mechanisms like Zoom. Next up, I'm just going to have to move your faces to read this quote. A lot of businesses are paying lip service to health and wellness. Leaders have to demonstrate the behaviour that they want to promote that aligns with their values and purpose. They have to model it. People have to feel like they have permission to take breaks and be human. And many of the students are really looking to organizations to really show and reveal the things that they're committing to. And we wanted to share with you here some of those commitments, things that really stood out, some of them slightly larger than others in terms of activities and actions that you could take. One of the organisations that Lindsay and I spoke to spoke passionately about the role that the CEO played in chairing the wellbeing initiatives. That organisation stood out as a place where many wellbeing and mental health initiatives were getting traction because of that senior level commitment. That might not be easy for everyone on this call to implement, but I can tell you that organisation was able to do more. One very simple thing, and as a mother, I love this, and I'm going to try and uh, deploy it maybe daily, but consider the mum factor. Um, I haven't given that justice in my English accent, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so consider the mum factor. A recruiter was saying that with every single activity that they were participating in, they were thinking, how would my mum, who is currently calling me frequently, consider what I'm asking these interns and students to do? And by giving that perspective, they were really honing in much more to empathy and the well-being of the students. And then something that we've seen a slight rise of, and I think we maybe will see more of, but people cancelling their traditional campus activity with it being led by um, alumni or uh, executives, but actually sponsoring well-being and mental health initiatives and bringing in experts to speak to the students about how they can work on their well-being at these times. So three uh, activities that really stood out from the research in relation to well-being and mental health. One of the things that we wanted to add in here as well is that over the last 12 months in parallel to the research, we were able to provide our strengths profile tool at Capfinity to um, a number of populations at no cost. We had over 50,000 people take strengths profile. And one of the things that we were able to do here is look at that data 
and see what were some of the themes that changed during the pandemic and where are the strengths of student populations in the US right now? Why am I linking strengths and well-being? Strengths, when we get to use them, are things that we're good at, but they also give us energy. So seeing these population trends in relation to well-being and how you might recruit students can be particularly um, informative. So first up, what we can see now today in terms of US student strengths is that students really want to be delivering work where they feel like they're offering service. That doesn't have to necessarily be in a service profession, but it is absolutely about being associated with roles and work where they're delivering a sense of responsibility and good work. And that good work leaks into the strength of gratitude as well. Moral compass, I think we can all understand why uh, students are particularly seeking to deploy their moral compass strength at this time, but it really also is incumbent on organisations to be able to show and reveal where their values and their, um, their, their trustworthy credentials can be deployed, particularly, particularly seen by, by students at campus events and really believed. And then the final piece that I think is, is, is hugely interesting is that students want to be esteem builders, that they're not just looking for things for you to do for them. They also want to be associated with work where they can coach and mentor and help others. So when you're thinking about both recruitment and roles and advertising, certainly these four things come into uh, to, to sharp focus. And then in contrast, what we've seen during the last 12 months on the decline, um, particularly within the US student population is a decline in self-belief, um, a decline in capacity to optimize time, and also the desire to be competitive. This would suggest this drains energy. These are things that could be difficult for students to, to do. When we're thinking about this in a recruitment context, um, it may very well be the case that if you want to attract diverse talent, running a competition right now would actually have a draining impact rather than it being a uh, positive and enforcing one. So moving then on from that strengths data, uh, our second theme is diversity, equity and inclusion. And again, I think we could pick up any white paper over the last 12 months and you'd hope that this theme would be there. I think what Lindsay and I found over the 12 months of the research was not just the level of seriousness, but the desire for action around this theme, but also the, um, the personal responsibility and ownership of the students wanting to seek out organisations that are genuinely doing work. This trend around the students being um, proactive on this topic was already in existence. This is some Ivy League um, research before the pandemic started, and it was demonstrating that students were already looking for organisations that weren't just bringing diverse candidates to or, or diverse alumni to their campus, but they wanted organisations that were genuinely committing to diversity publicly in a number of ways. We heard this um, in a very strong way, and it got stronger as the research continued, particularly people we spoke to in 2021. One organisation and one recruiter said to me, my first visit to a historically black college and university was in 2019, where we did a career panel and career fair. Students would come up and ask how long we had been coming to campuses like theirs. People want genuine commitment that DE and I is not a fad for the organisation. Equally, for organisations that were truly committing, they were seeing success. We launched a second year sophomore programme to get access to tap into the diversity pipeline earlier. That programme has doubled in size. We are quietly looking at a first year programme. Organisations that are committing to events and activities that are earlier on in the pipeline are having great success and people are moving into school. They're going even um, earlier than just second year programmes. I sit in on the webinars and meetings of all of my company's diversity networks. As a recruiter, I have the knowledge and the relationships. As a recruiter, I want to have the knowledge and the relationships. Lindsay and I were so struck by this recruiter who was essentially making sure that it was their business 
to know any aspect of those networks so they could use that information to inform all of their recruitment practice. And then finally, we increased our diversity pipeline this year, but next year our focus is going to be more strategic and targeted. We need to attract diverse talent who actually wants to work for us, not just encourage applications. There is a drive now with this level of seriousness around DNI that it isn't just about lip service and it's not just about attraction. It's also making sure that you go to the right HBCU for the roles that you are. Um, you want to seek application for, but also that you seek applications from people who want to join your organization. Some interesting uh, initiatives that we, uh, we noted, shamelessly, one I have to say is a Catfinity uh, platform, but one of the participants was uh, very proud of their virtual engagement employment platform, which was allowing them to prepare candidates early on and really level the playing field preparation of diverse talent has gone off the scale with organizations that are really committing to action. Developing recruitment readiness is a huge theme. We've mentioned this already, but launching a pilot early D program with first gen students who did a deep dive with some of our businesses, it was tremendously successful. We are doubling the program this summer. We know that if you can work with first gen students that you will radically change your diversity activities because many first gen students are also from different um, diverse backgrounds. There's an intersection of diversity. And then finally, um, and we will speak about this with our fourth theme as well, but organizations focused on supporting then when they make the hires of diverse talent. We hosted fireside chats for existing employees on how to have career conversations and apply for internal opportunities. We specifically promoted these to diversity employee resource groups. So really working on enabling that diverse talent once they're inside the organization. And we have clients this year at Capfinity who will forgo certain academic credentials and up their development in order to make sure that they can keep increasing their diversity. Lindsay, next up on the third theme. Thanks, Nikki. The third of our four themes that we learned from this year of research is how employers adapted to the increasingly remote and virtual environment while still continuing to balance the humanity of the recruiting process. Um, so we wanted to start with a quote that will kind of bring us all back to those very scary moments at the beginning of the pandemic. One recruiter reminded us that when cities and states were beginning to shut down, offices were closing, she got a call that said all recruiting and hiring plans need to be moved to virtual and we need to come up with an entire virtual summer internship program in the next 48 hours. I'm sure that um, rings a bell for a lot of us and maybe brings back some trauma of that moment, but everything happened so suddenly that now as we are reflecting on it, we've learned a lot of lessons of how to go virtual and go high tech while still keeping the humanity that's so important to the process. So here were some of the comments that we heard in the research about how to do that. Um, so much discussion of job fairs. And I think there was an assumption that young people, Gen Z college students would just love everything to be virtual because they love to use technology. And of course that is not the case. Um, networking virtually is not necessarily easier for students, one recruiter said. And many, many, many of you said that student engagement in virtual job fairs was down 50% and sometimes more. There was also a lot of discussion about going back to basics when it came to which technology to use. Some people got a little too sophisticated and complicated. And one recruiter said more complex career fair platforms did not result in better outcomes. My advice to universities is to allow flexibility of platform for employers to use what they use for business. Flexibility is most important. Some people even had to scrap entire career fair or recruiting plans because their firewall at their company was not matching with what the university had set up. Here's another quote, for our internship, we went old school. We created a workbook and mailed it to everyone on real paper. We shared content on the screen and interns also had the learning materials in front of them. It was hugely 
successful. And I think this is one of the transitions from our first phase of research to our second Nikki, which is everyone went super virtual the first time and then pulled back a little bit as the pandemic continued and said, there are moments where maybe we need to use the phone or need to use paper. And that was one example of how an organization pivoted back to some old school ways of doing work. Many people talked about the move away from core schools that virtual recruiting made more possible. We're trying to do more campus agnostic events. We're asking how can we leverage technology to look at the US as a whole? And this also dovetailed with the DEI conversation. I'd like to get the best female engineer in the US, not just focused on a specific school. There was also attention to how the role of a recruiter is changing and might need to change. Technology has helped build this persona of a campus recruiter who's very transactional, post a job, use tools. I don't think relationship building is being required as much. I don't know how you can do diversity hiring in particular without that. And one of the organizations we spoke to actually renamed recruiters to now be called candidate development specialists. And I think that really aligns with the young people feeling the process has become too automated and desperately wanting that human connection with the organizations they want to join. So a couple of specific examples of how organizations applied the hybrid technology humanity theme. Um, one, I think many of you would agree is while recruiting was maybe an afterthought virtually, one organization said, we will now always and forever have a virtual plan B for recruiting ready to go with anything that we are planning. We will plan things side by side with always that option. Another told us that we learned the biggest factor in whether new hires feel connected is really simple. It's whether their teams have their video cameras on for Zoom calls. And I was so struck by that student who said, that the recruiter was the first person uh, that they had seen all day live. So once people are on the team as interns or as employees, that camera on is really powerful. And I am just constantly shocked at how many young people are not seeing any faces on any of their calls. And finally, developing and deploying assessments that are authentic and immersive. We found that when doing assessments, which have become so much more common and popular, they really have to be personalized to your company so they don't feel generic. And it's really an opportunity to give students a glimpse into your organization, into your culture. Um, and in addition to that, the experience itself, students were very excited about assessments that gave them personalized feedback after. It didn't have to be from a person, it could be automatically generated, but it felt that it was personal to their experience and not something that everybody was receiving. And I think all of this leads really beautifully into the fourth theme, with, which Nikki will talk about. Thanks, Lindsay. So our final theme is around um, belonging, which as Lindsay shares does tie the first three together quite nicely. Belonging has had a lot of press in um, the last 12 months, and I wanted to share this quote with you. Yes, we should have a diverse slate of candidates. Yes, we should mandate pay, equity and equal opportunity for promotion. Yes, we should teach people about bias, unconscious or not. But at the end of it all, if the company doesn't create a place of high belonging, individuals do not know how to contribute and results do not change. For us at Capfinity, um, that's where strengths play a really big part is it does give you the lens to allow individuals that you hire to know how they can contribute. And we heard in the research some amazing examples of with the pandemic, the level of detail and attention that had gone into creating those moments of belonging, both in recruitment, but also in onboarding. Here's one. We are placing a lot of emphasis on the importance of belonging. This is far beyond a new employee's tech needs. How can we make sure we are creating a culture that welcomes them in, even though we are not together in person? And we heard many examples of people choosing to keep the approaches that they had learned in relation to belonging now into the future. There was such a need for us to find ways to give the interns and new hires one-on-one -on -one connections. People were struck by actually one of the benefits of the technology was the greater amount of access that they could give people to, and they're gonna keep that as they move forward. Executive involvement was also seen as a huge positive. 
executive involvement in campus recruiting makes a huge difference. That is a very positive outcome of the pandemic. And then finally, for the first time in the history of our rotational program, satisfa satisfaction scores were 100%. We have been more transparent, more communicative, more connected than ever. And we genuinely believe it was the thought, some of the, um, some of the thought that went into those panic moments that really upped the recruiter and the development team's desire to create connection and let people know how they could contribute from the moment they were brought into the organization. Some tips here that, um, that, that we felt you would enjoy, and, um, and we love this first one. One of the recruiters talked about creating local office and city tours, the virtual rough guide experience. They literally took their iPhone and they created almost the best tourist video of, you could live in this location, this is what the sandwich shop looks like, everything that the student couldn't see when they, they weren't there in person. Another um, L&D individual shared that they held smaller team piggyback calls following every company-wide town hall announcement and earnings report so that the interns were able to um, share questions and ask specific things that they wouldn't have felt like they wanted to in the chat window. Um, so they made sure that everything made sense post large announcement. And then finally, designated every Monday as education day, exposed interns to three times as many senior executive leaders and 10 times as many functions as normal. Going forward, we wanna keep this whether we are in person or remote. And this exposure for particularly intern populations to understand exactly what the organization is about and how they will be able to contribute longer term in their career are some of the positive things that happened in relation to belonging during this 12 months of the research. So we're gonna move now into a little bit of our own education uh, for ourselves as Lindsay uh, moves from this research to uh, discuss how we can look at recalculating as, uh, as recruiters and L&D professionals. Please do keep sharing any questions because we will pick them up shortly. Thank you so much, Nikki. So as we were thinking about sharing this research with you, one of the things that struck us um, from the first phase of the research, which was about halfway through the pandemic to now, is how much time we spent on those calls chatting about, how are you doing? How are you getting through? How is your team? This is not easy <laughs> that we are more than a year into it. I think probably, Nikki, we would have been shocked at the beginning if you had told us we would still be here um, with the pandemic you know, over a year later. And so we wanted to add some thoughts on how to lead through this very challenging, uncertain time. And um, as many of you know, I wrote a book during this time to talk about that. And I wanna share with you the genesis of the book. And then I'd like to share a couple of, of hopefully helpful tips for you and your teams and your organizations. Um, when COVID hit in March, 2020, I'm a professional speaker in addition to consulting and brand ambassador roles as I do with Capfinity. And my calendar went from completely booked to completely empty in a period of about two weeks. And it was pretty terrifying. And I know many of us had those kinds of experiences. And as I was sitting in my apartment, looking out the window, I saw cars on the street. And I just had this image of that moment when you're driving, you know where I'm going with this, and you make a wrong turn or there's traffic or you hit a fork in the road and your GPS says recalculating. And I just felt like all of us, when the pandemic hit, we're in our cars doing our thing, our jobs, our families, our lives. And suddenly our GPSs all said, sorry, you can't go that way anymore. You're gonna to have to do something different. You're gonna to have to recalculate. And although it's really frightening and challenging, I think it's also very optimistic because I know when my GPS says recalculating, I feel like, oh, okay, there's another way I can go to get to my destination. And all of us had to find different ways to recruit, to do our jobs, to manage people, uh, to keep in touch with our loved ones. The other feeling I have about recalculating as I interviewed some of you on the call and many job seekers, career changers, and people who were perfectly happy in their organizations but needed to change for these times is that your GPS never ever says, sorry, LaToya, sorry, Nikki, you have to go back to your driveway and start all over again. No, it takes where you are. 
and it pivots you from there. And so when I started to think about this metaphor, I came up with five strategies or what I call rules for recalculators to think about how to move forward in these times. And again, it's not necessarily if you're looking for a job or trying to change careers. Um, my friend, Andy O'Hearn, who's on the call said, recalculating is not a bug of careers today. It's a feature. We are all recalculating all the time. And if you want, I'll send you my sticker, hashtag we are all recalculating uh, because it's now something that we all have to do. I think we've all really learned the lesson that we can't coast, that we can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them. So I wanted to share five strategies for how to think through these times so that we can take all of the advice that we shared from our research and really apply it in a way when we're in the right mindset in order to move forward. So rule number one for recalculators is to embrace creativity. And I'll share a quote that um, embodies what I mean by this. Henry Ford said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. If I decided, well, I'm a professional speaker and I'm gonna move forward, I would have gotten nothing in 2020 because it wasn't possible to be a professional speaker anymore. I had to do more consulting, more coaching. I wrote a book, I had to pivot. And so we can't just simply say, this is how it's always been done. And I think progressive organizations knew that all along, but I think some of us maybe are in organizations that were not quite as innovative. And COVID has been this opportunity to say, we cannot keep going the way we were. We have to think of creative ways to move forward. So I have a, a tip to share on this. Just a really small way to become more creative is to cast a wider net in terms of where you're getting your information. So we hear a lot about upskilling and reskilling and we feel like, oh, do I have to go back to school and get a new degree? Many people I spoke with just watched a five minute YouTube video or listened to a podcast on a topic that they wouldn't normally listen to. I put the social media icons because maybe you just go and follow some topics or subjects of interest like cryptocurrency because you wanna learn about it. Doesn't mean you're gonna change careers, but you wanna understand what's there. Uh, one manager that I interviewed said every week he asked his teenage kids and his youngest employees, put a new app on my phone. I wanna learn how to do something new this week. It just sparks your thinking about what's possible. People to meet and study. Um, one of the things that, that someone told me is that instead of being jealous and envious of the people who seem to be thriving in these challenging times and saying, what are they doing? What's so great about them? Say, wow, cool, I'm gonna study those people. Use your envy as a catalyst. All those people who seem to be making their homes beautiful during COVID, I'm gonna follow them on Instagram and get some ideas for myself. What organizations can you join? What virtual events can you attend? And I think the other benefit of just dipping a toe in these changes is you're not investing too much. I interviewed someone from General Assembly that teaches coding, and they said they've really trained their intake professionals when people call and say, I've lost my job, I have to become a coder. I heard that's a job of the future. And they say, well, have you watched any videos on YouTube about coding? Have you ever tried coding one line of code? because you've got to dip a toe in somewhere. It doesn't have to be a full fudge dive in order to be more creative. Where can you just add little bits of creativity on a more regular basis? Recalculator rule number two is all about that action. And here's another quote to demonstrate what I mean from Dale Carnegie who wrote How to Win Friends and Influence People. Inaction breeds doubt and fear. Action breeds confidence and courage. If you want to conquer fear, don't sit at home and think about it. Go out and get busy. Stephen Isherwood of ISE, the Institute for Student Employment in the UK, similar to NACE here in the US, he told us that in 2008-2009, 50% of entry-level jobs in the UK went unfilled because kids thought that they weren't hiring and didn't apply for the jobs. So this paralysis of uncertainty is really damaging. I also spoke with the CEO of ZipRecruiter in the US who said at the beginning of the pandemic, yes, job postings were down, which everybody expected, but so were job applications. Even though more people were unemployed, they weren't taking action to apply. And we saw this with students as well. So really important to get out of our heads of worry and put things onto our to-do list. And I think a really good way to think about this is a concept many of you are probably familiar with, which is the growth mindset. 
the work of Carol Dweck out of Stanford University and author of the fantastic book Mindset. I see a lot of people nodding your heads. Um, we all know a fixed mindset and it was really easy to get into a fixed mindset during COVID. A fixed mindset says, I'm only good at certain things. I don't like challenges. I don't like difficulty. Don't criticize me. I don't want to do things I don't know how to do. We can't work from home in our organization. Hybrid model isn't right for us. Those are all fixed mindset mentalities. And what was really interesting to me, particularly my law firm uh, clients, who many of whom are on the call, is they always said, oh, no, 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 no. Lawyers can't work from home. Well, guess what? They did work from home because they had to. And that's what a growth mindset says. Anything is possible if you learn how to do it. You can be good at anything. You can try until you get the results that you want. Challenges are okay. We do this as individuals. A lot of people said, well, I don't like change. I'm not good at working from home. And there's one little word that I recommend applying to any of those fixed mindset sentences to completely turn that feeling around, whether it's personal or professional or organizational. And it's this tiny little three letter word. I think it's pronounced the same in uh, the UK, Nikki, as it is in the United States. It's the word yet. So if an organization says, well, the hybrid model isn't right for us yet because we haven't figured out the way that we can make it work. People in an organization can't work from home yet. Maybe we haven't given them the tools or the training that they need. I don't like change yet because I haven't found a way to make it comfortable. It suddenly takes things from the impossible to the possible. So one actionable tip to take away is to think really, 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 really small. Um, I, I'm really embarrassed now that I talked about eating my necklace because I know Nikki's a yes, psychologist and could probably have some... Uh, some right. psychological evaluation of that, but uh, some of you know, I had a bit of a, a peanut M&M situation during the pandemic where I was getting a little out of control. And I thought, you know what? I really not good at giving up the peanut M&Ms yet, but I could get a little better. And so one day I counted the number of peanut M&Ms I was eating, let's just say 20, it was many more, but I'll make myself sound good and say it was 20 a day. And I thought, okay, well, tomorrow I'm just gonna eat 19. That's a small step I can take to improve. So as you're thinking about your teams, as you're thinking about your career, as you're thinking about mentoring your employees, I think that we're sort of afraid right now to take huge steps because we don't know what the future is gonna look like and that's okay. So where can you take the smallest step that would get you toward whatever goal it is you have? And then the second action is to do it and to do it on a regular basis. It's easier to do something every day than to do it once a week or every three days. It also builds momentum. And I interviewed so many career services directors on campuses who said that they advise students to apply to one job a day. And it wasn't just to build the number of applications, it was to build the momentum that would keep them in the habit of job hunting. So prioritize action in order to achieve your goals, even if it's very, very small. The third way to implement all of our advice and to recalculate is to control what you can. I am a, a certified card carrying control freak. So this one is really hard for me, um, but I think we've all become used to in a way, the things that we can't control right now. And I just listed a few of the ones that we know are out of our control, the economy, the virus, when and if we return to the office. I mean, I think I spend half of my day guessing with people when and if we will return to the office. We also can't control other people, whether students come to our events, um, whether different uh, organizations want to partner with us, whether the people in our teams do what we want them to do. We can't necessarily control that, although we can influence it. So I really recommend focusing on what we can control. We can control things like our attitude, our work ethic, our daily habits, and our boundaries. And so I wanted to share a poster that I've seen on the wall of many universities that I think is always really good in going back to basics to think about ourselves, to share with our employees, and certainly to promote to students. Um, we talked about going back to basics with the hybrid of technology and humanity. Well, whether you're interviewing or attending a job fair on Zoom or in person, these 10 things that quote, re require zero talent are really, really important. So I might not be able to control whether my team is in the office or not, but I can have a positive attitude. I can show energy. I can be prepared for every meeting. And I think sometimes when we go back to these basics, when the big things are really scary, we can focus on all of these areas that are really not so basic at all. 
Rule number four of five for recalculators is to know your non-negotiables. Uh, we talked a lot about companies going back to a sense of belonging and culture. And I think there was a lot of talk about rituals and what does it really mean to work for this company? What does it really mean to achieve our goals? We might have to do it in a different way, but those are going to be meaningful for us. And I also recommend doing this on the micro level, which is within your team. One of the, the key factors I think in successful organizations, particularly in a remote environment when we can't be around each other is to make sure that all of our unwritten rules are actually written down and spoken about. So have you spoken with your team, with your colleagues about being clear on what your shared mission really is? how you want to communicate with each other. I worked with one team, you all know I'm obsessed with generations, where there was a baby boomer boss who was really annoyed that her millennial and Gen Z employees were never calling her during COVID. They were IMing her and texting her and DMing her on social media. And she said, why would they pick up the phone and call? And I asked her very simply, have you told them that you would prefer that they call? And she said, well, no, I just thought they would know that. And so we went to her team and said, did you know that your boss wants you to call her? And they said, no. We thought we'd be bothering her. She's at home with her family. We didn't want to bother her. Well, if it's a non-negotiable for you to be called and for them, it was a non-negotiable. They didn't want to bother their boss. That's something that needs to be talked about. So if you haven't in a while, it's a really good time to revisit the rules of the road of working together remotely. And I really recommend if and when we do go into the office or have a hybrid environment to talk about these are our rules. These are our non-negotiable rituals wherever we are working, make the unwritten written. And finally, rule number five is my favorite, which is asking for help. And I'll share the beautiful African proverb that some of you might be familiar with. If you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go with others. Um, being in community is so powerful. Thank you to all of you who are friends and colleagues quoted in the book, Capfinity clients, interviewees for this research. I think one of my favorite outcomes of the pandemic is getting to know people on a very different level. And I think people are more willing than ever to support one another and particularly students and entry level employees in this time. Um, but I encourage us again to be a little more creative in how we help each other. There's so much talk about mentoring and we saw a lot of increases in mentoring programs, but I think we can actually redefine mentoring a little bit and be a little bit more creative in how we offer it. And I have a statistic on the next slide that I wanted to share from uh, ATD. 75% of executives point to mentoring as playing a key role in their careers. They're not saying one mentor. It's the act of mentoring. And while it's wonderful if you have a, a perfect, beautiful Yoda-like mentor, that's really hard to find. And maybe isn't enough right now in these times, because frankly, I don't think there's a mentor out there who can mentor me in how to get through a pandemic because we've never done it before. And so what if we think of mentoring as an active verb that can happen in so many ways. Yes, traditional mentoring is wonderful and should continue, but I love reverse and co-mentoring, more junior people can mentor us. And many of us were mentored by junior people and how to use Zoom and Slack and other technologies. Micro mentoring is maybe a tweet that inspires somebody. Maybe it's everybody sharing one takeaway or piece of advice at the end of a Zoom call. All of that adds up. And personal advisory boards, one way to be more creative and always be recalculating is to make sure that your network is very diverse. Do you have people from different countries, different job functions, different industries, different races, ethnicities, sexual orientations, abilities, ages? All of that is really powerful. And I think we are all so eager to connect. One of the um, really beautiful things that I found at the beginning of the pandemic reminds me of uh, Nikki and Capfinity's research into strengths. Um, Google put out research that in March and April of 2020, there was a huge spike in searches for the phrase, how can I help? And I think if we continue that desire, it can be really powerful. And I, I wanna just end on uh, Nikki's comment that introverts have had a particularly difficult time I have so many questions. It might be the most common question I get online, which is how can introverts network and succeed in these virtual challenging times? And I think 
um, not just asking for help, but offering help is a really powerful way for all of us, introverts included, to network. Um, reminds me, in the old days, I was a spokesperson for LinkedIn, and Reid Hoffman, one of the founders of LinkedIn, said that he thinks people use LinkedIn wrong for networking. He said most people go into LinkedIn, or I would say any networking environment, and they say, what can I get? And he said, you should really do the opposite. You should come into any networking or mentoring um, or social media situation and say, what can I give? And I think if we all approach this very unique time, particularly um, all of you who care about this issue and care about early career professionals by asking, how can I help? Um, I think that will lead us into the future that we want. So thank you for allowing me to share a little bit about the book and my recalculating journey. Um, since we're talking about asking for help and asking questions, Nikki, I'll pass it over to you to invite everybody to uh, ask some questions to us. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, wonderful to also learn something on a webinar that you're providing when you can learn from your other speaker. So uh, that's uh, fabulous. I think Latoya has been looking at the chat and might be uh, ready to ask us our, our first question. Um, Anything, Latoya, that you want to pick out and please do share questions. And in this format, you can actually come off mute and ask a question live if you'd like to. But uh, Latoya, I don't know if you want to, to go first up and then uh, perhaps people will, will join in. I was just scanning through the comments and thank you everyone that's been sending them in. I picked the hardest one that I've seen so far because uh, why not, right? Um, and so the question is, um, well, first, thank you for sharing the, the research uh, what's the biggest thing that you learned going through it that you'll be able to apply going forward in your work and professional lives? So a nice juicy question. I'm happy to, uh, to, to go up first. So I think one of the things that I'm still processing about the research, if I'm honest, is the mood change from the start to where we are now. And I'm processing that a little bit as a psychologist um, because that mood change is that 2021 has got a slightly more serious and definite edge to it. And um, we certainly really from a DE and I, wellbeing and mental health, those items that might have just been topics at the start everybody is now looking at the road traveled, the results and actually taking action. And I would say the students as well as the recruiters. So there's this quite significant mood change um, where there was a lot of experimentation at the start and now people are really focused much more on, on action and navigating. Um, so that's something that, that I'm thinking about. And then the, the other piece, um, that I'm contemplating professionally is that we talk a lot that there's no blueprint, but as psychologists, there's no study I can go to that says, um, you know, people behave in traumatic circumstances this way, but nobody has done a study where the traumatic circumstance is global and relentless. And um, I'm, I'm interested in what that means for human behavior. And in some ways, it means we probably need to have to keep being resilient and keep digging in. But it also means at some point we have to acknowledge. And as we go forward, and I was thinking about campus events, even if they go back to in person, those students are not the students you met 12 months ago. Those are not the students that you met 24 months ago. They have had a different experience, but we don't have a study about how to handle that. So a couple of reflections, the seriousness and also the, the, the lack of blueprint as we move forward, which means we have to really act as a community and learn together, but acknowledge things are now different. Beautifully said, Nikki. I'd love to, to pose a question to you as well, Nikki, kind of on that same, same point. What advice have you found yourself giving as a co-founder of Capfinity? on how companies can make their assessment and recruitment process more inclusive. I think there's so much concern and attention to the fact that it needs to be inclusive. What's your advice on how to actually do that? How do you take the mentality and the, and the good intentions and turn it into action? 
Yeah, so you know I would love to fill 60 minutes on this topic. So I'll try and be I'll try and be brief. But the first one, and this has been important to us at Capfinity for really the last 16 years, but question any criteria in your process that might be arbitrary. And that might be academics, it might be experience, it might be hobbies that you've been looking for, but really question whether it's job relevant. We found when people do that, their capacity to recruit diverse talent rockets, particularly first gen talent. The second thing would be to um, really measure exactly what matters and make sure that everyone involved in the recruitment process has got the same view of what you're measuring. So if I say to you, Lindsay, let's set up a company and recruit lots of people who are resilient. My view of that competency of resilience might be different to yours. So know what success looks like and how you want to measure it, but make sure that that person who interviews that candidate on campus or that super day can really interpret that model as well, because that unconscious bias can come in, even if you've got the most brilliant um, bias fee process at the top of the funnel. And then finally, and I think um, this, is, this is happening increasingly across the US, but I think it's the tip of the iceberg, spend more time on preparation. If you are able to um, really lift the lid on what you're looking for, what your process is about, then, um, then go for it because preparation will help level the playing field for candidates that don't have a mentor, that haven't necessarily been surrounded by family members who've been to organizations like the one you're part of. So preparation and you driving that preparation as a recruiter is key. I'd be curious for those of you in the audience, what has resonated and felt aligns with what's happening in your organizations and what you might feel is different. Please uh, keep the questions coming as well. Nikki, I know you have a, a question for me. We can banter a bit while we're waiting for people to ask questions, um, but we would love to, to hear um, what is happening in your organizations and whether you're seeing some of the, the same trends we are. But Nikki, do you have any questions for me or anyone else? Um, reflecting on your your work um, prior to recalculating also on the generational piece. Is there anything when you think about going back to this hybrid model that you would, um, I guess, highlight things that people should be aware of from a generational perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. There's so much, so many assumptions, right? Oh, millennials are loving this because they love technology and, and boomers like to be around people and Gen Xers like being home. I think we're going right back to the stereotypes that you know my work and many others have been trying to bust for a very long time because we're assuming things. And the reality is there's so much intersectionality in how people are responding to the work from home situation, a hybrid. It has to do with your home situation, your family situation, your personality type, your physical and mental abilities, and your generation all wrapped up together. And so I think one of the challenges we're going to face is not everybody wants the same things and nor did they ever. And I think the organizations that will continue to thrive are the ones that have always provided options. Right? There's never been one answer, well, everybody wants to be in the office, everybody wants open space, everybody wants to work from home. That has never, ever been true. And so I think we have to resist the urge to make assumptions about who is uh, feeling what way. And I think a lot of the people that we interviewed through the research, really throughout the pandemic, but particularly in phase two, is they're doing a tremendous amount of employee surveying um, and finding out what people want, what people are looking for, um, and finding solutions. There is no one size fits all. There never will be, but we've really got to find out the reality of what people are looking for. So I would say it's been a little concerning, you know, and I was really uncomfortable at the beginning of the pandemic with, oh, it's young people spreading it. No, it's elderly people spreading it. We don't need to go back to that. It doesn't serve anybody. We really need to be, be inclusive. And, and I think the more we can do that, the better off we'll be. So same message, but I did feel a little bit of backsliding. That's really helpful, Lindsay. Um, I th we have probably time for one more question before we have to wrap up, but I just want, you know, there's tons of comments um, and, you know, thanking you both for, for today's presentation. And, um, but the, I'll, I think the last one I'll, I'll go with is, um, is uh, that the question is really around, we have a few new, newer associates and, um, you know, sort of in the onboarding process, and it seems like they might be struggling a little bit how do uh, the question is how to make it safe 
uh, the environment feels safe for them to kind of ask for support. Any suggestions there? I'll, I'll start Nikki and then you can join in. And I saw uh, Michelle posted a question about introverts who don't want to return to work. You know, I'm always wary of um, being too accommodating to what everybody wants all the time. We can set some boundaries and we can set some rules. Um, I, I think we're going to see more flexibility, but probably more of a return to the workplace than uh, people think. Um, I think there'll be, again, a lot more flexibility, but I don't think that we're going to an entirely hybrid model. I think it's too complicated. I think there are commercial real estate cost concerns. And I think people are creatures of habit and, and frankly, social um, and want to be together. So what I think is important for the early career onboarding question that you asked Latoya and introverts and, and really all of us is we've got to listen and we've got to let people have their say. It doesn't mean we're going to do what everybody wants, but I think it's the same message I've, I've been giving for years about millennials and Gen Z is just let people share how they're feeling. Let them give input into what the situation is gonna be. I think that the idea of a top-down hierarchical, my way or the highway, basically it's never made people happy, but Gen Xers and boomers, we were kind of used to it. And I think that that model is really not going to work in this situation. And I think it goes back to that idea of two things that really stood out in the research to me, particularly when it comes to onboarding is the incredible importance of personalization and one-on-one -on -one relationships, which is you are not some nameless person joining a nameless corporation. You are a human being. We wanna to get to know you. We want you to feel included. And that goes from giving you a shirt to giving you a virtual background. Um, one company had each person, instead of having one person call to welcome them, every single new employee had four existing employees call them. That's not a hard thing to coordinate. It just takes some effort to say, we want you to feel personally welcomed into our environment. And for those who aren't sure if they wanna go back or you know are feeling uncomfortable, I wanna know that a human being has heard my concerns. I know that it might not turn out, but I wanna feel listened to. And so I think it goes back to the earliest, earliest, earliest relationship building tool, which is one-on-one, -on -one, face to face or zoom to zoom conversation as much as we can. Um, I know I might sound a little um, you know, optimistic, but I don't think it's that hard to try to give everybody the opportunity to feel heard. Nikki, I'd love your thoughts on onboarding and, and inclusivity. Yeah, and I think just, just an ad um, that this piece around belonging and being quite specific on how individuals can contribute both in the recruitment process, but then if they're hired in the onboarding, you can have any personality type, but still contribute if you know what you need to do. And I think when we're not necessarily in person or we're navigating ambiguity, being very, very clear in expectation, how you want individuals to contribute, but not prescribing the way in which they need to do it will really help the flourishing of inclusion, but also those non-visible differences like personality come through. From a strengths perspective, we know that we have people who are highly introverted, but love giving presentations, you know, complete activities that aren't the stereotype of an introvert. You just need to let people know how they can contribute, but then they find their way to that contribution. I think we are just about at time. Nikki, we um, need to do a commercial for LinkedIn Live. We do need to do a commercial for LinkedIn Live. So if anybody has enjoyed what they've heard today, um, and if chat is anything to go by, at least one of you has enjoyed the content. Um, Lindsay and I uh, provide a series uh, called Future Strong, where we bring in uh, every fortnight every Friday at um, 10 o'clock Eastern time. We speak to individuals who are sharing their knowledge um, with you regarding any topic to do with supporting future talent. We have this week, Maura Quinn from Liberty Mutual talking about HBCU strategies. Um, but across the coming months, we have great speakers uh, coming up, which Latoya will share with you uh, when she gets back in contact with you post this session. But if you've enjoyed this, then please dial in tomorrow at 10. And, uh, and if you can't make that, then LinkedIn Live is forever with us. So you will see all of our other past catalogue and goofy moments, mainly by me um, and Lindsay poking fun at me. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's brilliant insights and people have been incredibly giving academics, um, psychologists, but also recruiters. So uh, Moira is tomorrow.
Got a lot of love for Moira in the chat window as well. So that, <laughs> that should be trailer enough. Thank you, Dan Black. Um, wonderful. Well, we will stay here for a second if anyone has any questions, but thank you so much for those of you that contributed to the research. You will be getting a formal uh, report of the findings. And um, thank you for everybody who has listened in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon.